Well, hello, good morning. Welcome back to the Alaska Sea Life Center for another one of our virtual visits. So, of course, we've been doing live on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock uh, Alaska time. So we are glad to see folks tuning on in for these, and we're always happy to bring you to the Sea Life Center. We've got to thank our sponsor for these programs, uh, and that is Royal Caribbean Group. The Royal Caribbean Group has uh, sponsored this season, which means we can get it out there free uh, for everyone to just watch online. Like I said, Wednesdays at 11, Alaska time, uh, we are doing these programs. So if you tuned in last week, uh, we were down at Harbor Bottom, uh, which is one of the first exhibits that you, you see when you come to the Sea Life Center. Uh, and this week, we're actually like basically just right down the hallway. We're at the next exhibit, and that is our Kelp Forest exhibit. So the Kelp Forest exhibit does have uh, some kelp in it. You actually saw a view. And we can kick back on over to our, our little live handheld. Uh, and maybe I'll zoom around this tank a bit. So you can see we do have kelp in there, but we're going to talk about our kelp. Uh, because believe it or not, some of this kelp real. Some of the kelp in the sea life center, not real. Uh, so we're going to talk about that today. But in here, we have lots of rockfish. They're all just off camera for me. So here are our rockfish. We're going to be talking about them today. And we've also got some other stuff in here, uh, a lot of invertebrates, like our sea anemones that you can see waving around. And we talked a smidgen about sea anemones uh, in other programs, but we'll hopefully see these get fed in a bit later today. And other invertebrates we have, let's see if I can zoom way in up on the top here. Our sea stars really like to just hang out at the very, very top of this habitat. And if you tuned in last week, uh, or if you go and take a look after this program at our Harbor Bottom program, uh, we actually show you kind of what these exhibits look like from behind, where they are just open. Uh, so those sea stars kind of crawl on up there, and sometimes they'll even get sort of up on top of the rocks, right at the very edge of the water. Uh, now, they don't you know, pull themselves all the way out, but they like to get on up there, kind of wedge themselves in the, the crevice that forms up there. And so we're going to be talking about this tank. Um, and one of the things that I, I, th I think this tank kind of just gets overlooked a bit by visitors here to the Sea Life Center. And that's because you have the kelp forest tank, uh, but it is right before you get to the touch tank. So if we kind of pan our camera on over, you can even see there is the uh, tank right next to kelp forest. And this has some little kelp in there too. It's more like little eelgrass. But right back behind this tank, that's the edge of our kelp forest starting right over, or uh, edge of our touch tank, excuse me, starting right over there. I think people get to the kelp forest tank they say, oh, the, the touch tank is right around the corner, and they just keep going. So this, I feel like, is kind of an overlooked tank, and it's really a cool tank. And that's because kelp forests are just such a, an interesting environment, and they provide a lot of nurseries for these animals. So we've got just some footage of those rockfish close up. And that's one of the things we have in here. We have a lot of rockfish. Now, these aren't the biggest rockfish that we have here at the center, uh, and that's kind of the point. A lot of times, kelp forests, uh, or like we saw uh, at the next tank, the little eelgrasses, those provide nursery environments for things like rockfish or for any growing fish, really. Uh, and that's because, you know, when you're small in the ocean, there's a million things that can get out there and eat you. Uh, and if you're a little baby rockfish, you might even get eaten by other rockfish uh, when you're small. And so these kelp forests serve as, uh, like I said, sort of a nursery. Now, when we feed these animals in here, it's kind of just a, a free-for-all. Uh, so we can, we can toss up. The feeding was yesterday, but I came out and got some footage. And you can see just little bits of, I think it was squid yesterday, floating around. And watch how they eat, because that's important. When I'm talking about if you're a small rockfish, you're going to get eaten by a bigger rockfish if you're just hanging out with them sometimes. Rockfish are not chewers, let's say. Uh, when they grab their food, they're really mostly just coming in there, uh, and they sort of open their mouth and gulp that food into their mouth. Like we got a camera uh, down for a moment there. There we are. Uh, so with the rockfish, right, they just kind of cruise on up the food. They just rip their mouth open, and that sort of pulls food into their mouth, and then they'll just gulp it down. So if you're a small fish, if you can fit inside a rockfish's mouth, you might get eaten. Uh, and so that's sort of why we, I don't know, we, we, we sort of split out the fish that are in our tank based on their size. So I'm actually going to go back to that next little tank, because we, you can see the rockfish here. Uh, behind me in this tank, we've got a lot of quillback rockfish. We do actually have a little yellow eye rockfish down there. Oh, you can just barely see it at the bottom of the screen. This nice uh, kind of orange fish there. But we're going to kick on over to the next tank because this has some little tiger rockfish. Let me get on close to them. 
because they are they are tiny what and uh, a little skittish uh, which again you know as as little tiny fish they can be skittish so you got some tiger rockfish floating in there you might be able to see they are very small so we wouldn't want to put these in to the kelp forest tank because if we put these little ones in with kelp forest the kelp forest uh, rockfish and they would probably eat them and likewise if we take the the smaller uh, like medium-sized juvenile rockfish from our kelp forest tank we put them say in our aviary tank uh, where we have some full-grown rockfish you know they might be in danger too so that was a question we get not infrequently is sort of how do you keep them from eating each other uh, and basically we just try to be real careful with it make sure one we don't put natural predator and prey in together but two for things that kind of just go around and eat whatever they can fit in their mouth we want to make sure we don't put anything really small <laughs> that they'd be able to easily gulp down in the same tank as them and again we've got that eelgrass here and so that eelgrass serves you know, sort of sort of the same purpose as we were talking about with the kelp forest where it is a environment where they can use it as a nursery so going back to our uh, kelp forest tank over here you'll see of course that we have thicker grasses uh, in the form of whoop, my remote has decided to not turn my camera there we go we've got some uh, you know, what you might notice is full kelp. Now, I mentioned that we have some kelp in the building, some uh, vegetative growth in the building that is real. And unfortunately, the kelp in our kelp forest tank is, is not real. Uh, in fact, I have one of the pieces of kelp here out of the tank. Um, and you know, there's a couple reasons for this. Uh, but one of the things you'll notice, if I, if I kick on over to the handheld camera here, I'll actually zoom in close on that kelp. And you're gonna see that it grows uh, or it gets overgrown, I suppose, with its own algae. So you can see our kelp in here, it looks kind of fuzzy. Uh, and that's because there is algae that grows on that kelp. Uh, so any sort of substrate you provide. And I mean, we have other stuff that grows in this tank. You can see that, you know, on the rocks themselves, of course, we get all those nice pinks, and those are our corals that grow here. Uh, but even just see if I zoom in up here you can see there's a little bit of algae growing on the rock naturally there so we do have stuff that grows here um, and we even have things that grow a bit larger uh, yesterday I took a piece of kelp and we've got some footage of that I believe some kelp that I fed on over to our urchins It looks like I actually don't have the kelp footage. Uh, excuse me. And so uh, we'll just kick on back to our main camera then. What I was going to say is that our kelps here do get eaten. And so if we had uh, sort of a, a real bull kelp in there, we have urchins in a lot of our tanks, and they will actually go and uh, eat their way through this kelp. And that's where we use some of the kelps we do grow. So for example, we get kelp that grows in our bird habitat. It's pretty low kelp. It's nothing like these, these big old bull kelps, for example. Uh, you know, you can get fronds maybe this big or a little bit bigger, pretty thick, but every once in a while one of those breaks free uh, or, you know, we'll collect a bit, and that can go into our touch tank where we have a bunch of urchins. And those urchins will actually eat that kelp. So if we just had kelp growing in tanks with urchins, that would probably not work out too well. Now, we do have critters in here that will actually go around and eat the algae. We've got snails, for example. Uh, and so they're really small. You kind of got to look for them. Uh, and we do have a clip of the snail in our kelp forest tank. So you might be like, where's that snail at? I see the algae. I see some kelp back there. Well, the snail in this case is on the glass. So you can actually see two snails here. You got the one up top and the one down below. And they just cruise around on that acrylic. Uh, and they can cause a little bit of problems. So you see some scratches in that acrylic. That is one of the problems that we face with our acrylic is that it gets scratched. And then algae grows in that. We've got to clean it extra, extra vigilantly. Uh, there is a little urchin back there as well. Uh, but Things like snails, uh, they go around, the way they eat their algae is actually with a grinding tongue called a radula. Uh, kind of think of how like, you know, a cat's got a rough tongue. Imagine that rough tongue uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, scraping away at grass or algae. And that's sort of how these snails eat. And if they're on the acrylic scraping away, they can actually uh, leave little marks. So fortunately, those tiny snails we have, not a big issue, but we do have some relatives of theirs like titans, uh, giant gumboot titans, which get pretty large, and they actually will kind of rasp away. And if they are kind of rasping the same spot over and over, 
they can rasp away at that acrylic. So we have to keep these tanks pretty clean. Now I mentioned feeding yesterday, uh, and one of the fish you have in here is called a ronkel. And I got a great little clip of that uh, fish particularly uh, or being particularly aggressive with its feeding. So we can toss up our ronkel from yesterday. Now you can see that yellow eye rockfish in the forefront there, in the foreground. And uh, a little piece of food is going to catch his eye. And the ronkel is the one in the background there. That is an Alaska ronkel. So here comes a piece of squid. The rockfish is looking up at it, but that ronkel sees its opportunity. It kind of comes on in there, and the rockfish just turns away. He's like, oh, I don't want anything to do with that, right? So we do get a little bit of aggression sometimes. They're not attacking each other, but they will be like, ah, no, that's my food, and they'll go for it. And I mentioned last week, someone's like, how do you make sure everyone gets fed? Well, we basically have to toss in food, see that, you know, you know everyone's still eating. We'll toss in a little bit more. Uh, less fish are going after the food now. Maybe they're starting to get enough. But if there's a fish that we just know is really timid or, uh, you know, it's not going to go after that food, we will actually target feed that animal. And so we have some footage of a crab getting target fed, actually, in the next little tank over the one that's got eelgrass. And that's because uh, the little tiger rockfish in there and the flatfish that we have in there are pretty aggressive. So if we feed that little kelp crab, we have to make sure that it gets fed uh, with a target pole. So we have a little crab target video for you. And that's the target pole. You just kind of stick that piece of food right on the end of it. And it lets you direct exactly where it goes. And you can see that flatfish sees it. And that uh, tiger rockfish see this food coming down. They're coming for it. But we want to make sure the crab gets it. Right? So they, they're aggressive and they want that food. Um, but the crab is a lot less capable of just running around and grabbing food. Right? So our target, in this case, our target feeding allows us to give food directly to uh, who we want to give it to. So I think we're going to explore this tank in just a little bit. But before we do that, I want to remind you that if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type those questions on down in the chat. Uh, and you can also text us. We, we uh, put that text down in the description when we are live. So feel free to ask us any questions. And while we're waiting on a couple questions here, I want to take a look at our sunrise this morning. You thought I forgot. I see you over there at the computer going, like, oh, he forgot. We've got Laura at the computer today. Rebecca's taking questions as well. So this was our sunrise this morning. I don't know. We've all been talking this morning. We can smell a little smoke. And you can see maybe on this sunrise time lapse here, there is maybe a little bit of smoke in the bay. Um, so, you know, we, we do have lots of houses around here do wood fires, but there's also people go out and burn trash, for example. Um, so haven't heard about any large fires. Uh, but living in a fjord, as we do here, which is that glacially carved, uh, valley, and in this case, it's filled with water, right, a, a fjord. Um, the smoke kind of gets trapped in it, unfortunately. So in the past couple of years, Laura's been here for them. We've had bad forest fires in other areas of the state. And if that smoke makes it to Seward, makes it to uh, Resurrection Bay, our fjord here, it just gets stuck here. So even though the fire is not here, it's not near us, we, we feel the smoke a lot of times. Any questions? We do have one from YouTube. Doreen is asking, what kind of feed, uh, what do you feed the rockfish? Oh, perfect. Yeah, we can toss up that video while I talk about our, of our rockfish feeding. Yesterday, it was uh, squid. So chopped squid, right? That's one of the things that we feed a lot of animals here. In fact, every department at the Sea Life Center, right? The aquarium, uh, the, 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 excuse me, the aviary, the, the birds, the avian staff, and our mammal staff, they all feed their animals squid at some point in time. So that's what was fed to these fish yesterday. Uh, and we actually have an anemone feed video that was yesterday as well. So even the anemones are getting the squid. And that happens because as that squid kind of drifts down, you can see the anemone tentacle managed to just grab it and sort of pull it on over. So squid is a good source for a lot of the animals here. Um, but uh, these fish were fed yesterday, and they're going to get fed again tomorrow. And I believe on the menu for tomorrow are silver sides. Uh, which are tiny, tiny little fish. Um, like I mentioned, if you're a tiny fish, rockfish can kind of just come gulp you up. Uh, and so those silver sides will get cut into some smaller pieces and thrown in, and they'll be eating those as well. So mostly squid in a lot of cases, or at the very least, squid makes up a big part of the diet. Another question. So one of our questions, you kind of already just answered it. Okay. Margaret was wondering, how often do you feed the animals in your tank? Oh, so it depends on the tank. It depends on the time of year. It depends on who we've got in there. 
Um, so for a lot of tanks, it's maybe every other day. Uh, a lot of these animals out in the wild may not even be eating every other day. That might even be a lot for them. So uh, things like an octopus, right? They would go out, they would go hunting, they would leave the safety of their den. They'd go out hunting, they'd find some food, they'd haul that back to the den, and then they might just you know, sit there for maybe a week even, depending on what they caught, and just kind of pick away at that. So we don't need to feed all of our animals every day. Now there's some animals that do get fed every day, uh, right? So our birds, for example, every single day, multiple times a day, they're getting fed. And same thing for the mammals. Uh, but sort of more your, your, your cold-blooded uh, animals, they can go longer without food. Uh, and in fact, they're, they're used to going longer without food. If we just tossed food in every day or multiple times a day into some of these habitats, the food would just kind of pile at the bottom, and then we'd have to add a lot of either uh, you know, waste processors like our sea cucumbers, for example, the little Roombas of the sea, they scoot around, they suck up all the leftovers, but we don't have them in every single tank. So we'd either have to be cleaning the tanks more ourselves or we'd have to introduce more scavengers to get in and, and clean up that mess. So we try to feed them uh, on, a, on a cycle where they're, they're always hungry, um, but they're always getting enough, and that way we're not wasting any food. Any other questions? Yeah, um, so the, with, you said that some of our kelp is fake. Yes. Do the animals eat the fake kelp? Ooh, that is a good question. So I don't see any that's been kind of chewed away right here, but I did mention, of course, urchins. They love to eat kelp. Well, they won't really eat our fake kelp. Um, but as stuff grows on the kelp, things that eat the stuff that grows on the kelp can start to damage that fake kelp. So let me see. I've actually got... A little bit of eel grass here, of our fake eel grass, because we have fake eel grass as well. And there's some little, I don't know, I don't think it's even going to show up. Probably not. Oh, you can kind of see it. It's a little rough on that corner. See if I can get that to focus. It's a little bit rough. doesn't show up very well. Um, now, the whole piece isn't, you know, broken or chewed away, but probably what happens is a little bit of algae grows on that. Uh, and then as something like a snail comes in and, and rasps away at that uh, algae, it's going to rasp away little bits of our fake kelp as well. So we do have to clean the kelp. We'll actually uh, do that. Any other questions? Yes. Do you need a pressure tank for the rockfish? Oh, good question. So we'll cut on over to our live handheld, uh, and let's check out some of our rockfish here. Take my handheld. There we are. So here's a, just a quill back hanging out here. Now, anyone who's gone fishing for rockfish, or maybe fishing for other fish, uh, like halibut, and you, you've caught a rockfish by accident, Right, you can find rockfish down pretty deep. So do we need a special pressure tank for our rockfish? Well, no. If you remember earlier, I mentioned that this tank is just open to the top. So it's a good question because these fish can be found very deep where the pressure is high. And you might know if you bring up a fish from the depth uh, where that high pressure is up to the surface, that, that change in pressure can actually hurt the fish, right? It's called barotrauma. Um, but in the case of our fish here, we get them when they're a lot younger usually. And when they're younger, they tend to be in shallower waters. Uh, in fact, we bring in our seawater from the bay, from Resurrection Bay. Uh, we, we draw it into an, a well under the building. And every once in a while, we'll send divers down into that well, and you will find rockfish that have just kind of made themselves a little home in there. Uh, or you'll find other animals. Sometimes you'll find shrimp. Uh, sometimes you'll find an octopus that's eaten all the shrimp. Um, but these animals can be found in shallower waters. And that's when we usually get them, is when they're in shallow waters. Uh, for example, those little, uh, the little tiger rockfish that we saw in that, in that other tank, uh, they are very young, so they can be found very close to shore uh, in shallow waters. And it's not like they need more pressure as they grow. It's just when you're bigger, you can go deeper, and there's maybe scarier things down there that would have eaten you when you were young. But now it won't be such a problem. Any other questions there, Laura? While I've got the looking at our rockfish here. Yeah, we have a question from YouTube. Okay. How many rockfish do you have? Oh, gosh. And maybe an easier way to say is how many different types of rockfish do we have? Well, just in this tank alone, we have three different types of rockfish. So we've got, um, where is our yellow eye rockfish that I was pointing out earlier? It's very nice and bright. Oh, it's tucked in the back there. So not very bright when it's tucked in the very back. Let's pull up. I think I've got just some footage from yesterday, because that's one of the things you can always sort of anticipate, is that these fish will hide when we want to show them live. So here's our yellow eye rockfish. So we have yellow eye rockfish in this tank. We have quillback rockfish. I think we, uh, just if we pull up the, the rockfish loop, we can probably see that quillback in there. Uh, and then we also have um, a cubic sound rockfish in here, which is a smaller rockfish. 
And the cool back's so named, of course, because they got those little quills uh, on their back there. So we just have three types in this kelp forest tank, but elsewhere in the building, of course, we have the tiger rockfish right next door that I've been talking about. Um, we also have like dusty rockfish. Um, we've got, oh gosh, I'm going, going blank on the different types of rockfish. We do have maybe five or six different types of china rockfish is another one. Um, so we do have a variety here. And just Alaska by itself has a variety of rockfish. Um, they're a pretty, I want to say they're a pretty common fish, but at the same time, they are very susceptible to uh, having their population really dropped down by, by overfishing or by unregulated fishing. That's because many of them can, can actually live a, a quite a long time. They may not even start to reproduce until they're pretty old. And so if you're out there just fishing, 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 you can actually uh, catch them, catch enough that aren't reproductive or haven't had an opportunity to reproduce yet. Once they become reproductive, they are uh, pretty prolific. You know, we've got yellow eye rockfish, for example, can they can give birth to you know two, almost three million babies all in one go. So once they are reproducing, you know they're really contributing. Uh, not all those babies, not even most of those babies are going to survive probably. Uh, but by having so many babies, they really up those chances. So that's one of the things about rockfish. Lots of lots of them, uh, lots of different types of them. But it can be deceiving because they take so long to reproduce uh, that you 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 can outfish them. Looks like maybe another question. We have a question from Redoubt Elementary School. Okay. Uh, do you adjust the water temperature at all through the seasons, or does it stay the same year round? That's a fantastic question. Do we have to adjust the water temperature? Well, one of the things that makes it easy for us is that we're pulling our water from Resurrection Bay, right? We bring seawater in from the sea. And not just from the sea, but from the sea that these very fish can be found in. So we are already drawing in water that is the temperature they need. We don't have to heat it up. We don't have to cool it down for them. And that includes through the seasons, right? Because if we're pulling water in in the summer, it's summer temperature of the seawater. If we're pulling in the, in the winter, it's winter temperature of the seawater. So we don't have to change it for these fish. And you know, something that leads to is that the Sea Life Center only has animals that can be found in Alaska, right? We are the Alaska Sea Life Center. If we had a coral reef tank or something like that, you know, something more tropical, then we would have to really adjust to that water. Um, there are some animals that get like heated water bowls, for example, with the birds. If you've seen our bird virtual visit, uh, one of those virtual visits, we looked at some electrically heated bowls, and that's mostly to just keep their food from freezing solid overnight. Another question? Yes. Can the spines or the quills on the back of a rockfish poke you, Ooh. and do they come out when you get poked, when like a get poked. porcupine? Uh, if we pull up just the rockfish, where the, uh, there's a quill back right at the beginning there. So do the spines on these rockfish, you can see them. Unfortunately, they're kind of laid flat. I don't think they're going to pop up too much. Um, but when these fish feel threatened, they will pop those spines up on their back. Uh, in this case, it's, it's why a quill back is named a quill back. They got these real, I think they've got about, I want to say it's like 12 overall, maybe 13. You saw it just pop up a little bit right there, right? So those spines are venomous. Now, can they stab you? Um, if you, you know, if you put your hand on one, Yes, then they can poke you. Um, you know, if the fish like really rammed into you, maybe, but they don't. They don't like throw them at you. They don't. Uh, they don't shoot the spines out or anything like that. Um, now I mentioned there's a venom. You don't want to get stuck by these spines. Now in rockfish, um, overall that venom is pretty mild in its effects. It could obviously cause a uh, you know swelling, uh, severe pain. Um, you might get like real sweaty. There are people that could even have an allergic reaction to it. But there are other rockfish out there, uh, excuse me, other fish out there that have venomous spines much worse, right? Rockfish are in a group of fish, a larger group of fish uh, called scorpion fish or scorpion forms. Uh, and uh, that's because of this, this venomous barb. Uh, and you've got things out there, um, stonefish, for example, you know, crazy bad venom. That could kill a person, kill a full grown person. So there are fish that can. Our fish here, you don't want to get stuck by them. They will hurt. They will give you a little bit of, of venom. But, you know, fingers crossed you wouldn't kill anyone uh, outside of maybe that, that allergic reaction I mentioned possible. So speaking of different types of fish, is there anything else in this uh, exhibit except for just rockfish? Ooh, that's a great one. Let's kick on over to the, the hand cam here, and I will see what I can find. Now, you might notice every time I go to that hand cam, I'm, like, walking off to the side. So that is because this is another one of our... Our tanks at an angle, right? Things are very strange here. So I'm standing at one side, but our, our live cam or our hand cam is over on the other side. So other than rockfish, let's see who we can find. Ooh, 
I showed you that clip earlier of the Alaska Ronco coming in to steal some food, but I actually see him right now hanging out over here. And so this is actually kind of uh, their territory. They're, they're a little bit territorial. Um, and there is a den on this side, or a burrow on this side. And speaking of a burrow, I'm going to show you another one. Uh, the two kind of corners of this tank have burrows in them. I'm trying to drop my camera down a little bit so we can get a closer look at this ronkel. There you go. So is that ronkel not a rockfish? Now, we also have a sculpin in here. Oh, all right, so our yellow eye rockfish is kind of in the way of seeing this sculpin. I'm going to zoom in, though, and you might be able to see a grumpy little face peeking out from the rocks there. <laughs> all right, get out of the way, yellow eye. All right, so right there we've got a little sculpin hanging out. Um, and we actually have another fish in here. I'm glad I did come get footage of it yesterday. Uh, so we'll get to that in just a second. But while I am looking around with the live camera, I do see another one back here. And unfortunately, we'll have to pull up some photos of this too. There's kind of a long, eely looking thing here. Right? There's its tail. Coming up, coming up, coming up. And then its head's kind of hidden behind that anemone. Believe it or not, its head almost looks like an anemone. This is a decorated war bonnet. And I'm going to have Laura toss up some pictures of this. Uh, this, again, is from PhotoArk, uh, provided by Joel Satori and his PhotoArk project. So I, I highly encourage anyone to go check out PhotoArk.com for more fantastic photos like this. But this is a decorated war bonnet. This one is actually from the Sea Life Center. And that is what we were just looking at. And you might recognize this. You might be like, we've seen this before. We do have a decorated war bonnet in our Harbor Bottom exhibit as well. Now, I mentioned there was another one hiding in here. Um, and unfortunately, it's down in a burrow. So we are going to look at a rock green link. And the rock green link is just a gorgeous fish. I got some footage of it yesterday. So you can see some interesting colors on this rock green link. This one was right after feeding. I, I think it kind of came out and was looking around for a bit of food. I think it managed just to find a piece of squid down the corner. But you're going to see it's going to swim right back in its burrow. It did not spend a lot of time out and about. Now, the rock green link looks like, oh, gosh, a gorgeous fish. We actually have just a photo of it that we can pull up as well. There you are. So very good-looking fish. One of the weird things about rock greenlings is that they have blue meat. If you went fishing, uh, I don't think it's all of them. There's a, a significant uh, percentage of them actually will have blue meat inside of them if you, uh, if you went and caught them and, and filleted them. Uh, it's a little bit strange. So those are the fish that we have in this tank. And then we do have some invertebrates as well. We've got our sea stars, we've got our sea urchins, we've got our sea anemones. We had those little snails that we were looking at earlier. Um, every once in a while we have a chitin in here, which is related to the snails, but um, not in a spiral shell. Instead, it's got little armor plates down its back. And we will sometimes have a wolf eel in here, getting back to those fish. We don't have one right now, but we do actually have a young wolf eel in the building that I think probably is just about getting to the size where they'll start thinking about putting them into our kelp spores tank. Another question, it looks like. Yes, back to rockfish. Do marine mammals eat rockfish? And if so, are they immune to the venom? All right. Do marine mammals eat rockfish, and are they immune to the venom? Let's toss up that clip of the rockfish again where you can see those spines pop up. Uh, but more importantly, you can see those spines lay flat because, yes, marine mammals will eat rockfish. Now, the spines will deter some things from eating them, right? Like if, if, if a sea lion has gotten jabbed by this particular fish before, they might be like, I don't like eating that. That hurts. But you will notice that these spines lay flat for most of the time. And they flatten down from the head back. So when they're rising up there, when they're, when they're being raised up, they're coming up from the back forward. So something like a sea lion will swallow its food whole. And they will do that by getting a hold of the head of the fish and then kind of line it up down their throat. And as they swallow that fish whole, those spines are all going to go flat down its back. So there are animals that could just swallow a rockfish. Uh, including marine mammals, and they'll, they'll do it. So another great question from Readout Elementary. Uh, do fish in the tank get injured by other fish very often? Ooh, that's a great question. So uh, you did see a little bit of aggression. If we, if we pull up the crab clip, I think, we can, you, you can see that they did kind of come and, uh, and bump into that crab uh, a little bit, which is why we had to target feed that crab. I love this clip because the flatfish just kind of gives up and sits there like, maybe he'll go away. Maybe he'll leave that fish, or uh, leave the, the squid behind. Do they hurt each other frequently, though? No, not, not really. And again, that's in part because we carefully plan it so that they don't. Right? We don't want to put anything that is going to be particularly aggressive towards its neighbors. We don't want to put anything that's 
really going to be trying to eat its neighbors nonstop. So we do try to avoid conflict. Now, that being said, we do have territorial fish, um, you know, especially some of them while they're laying eggs in the, in the bird habitat. We've got a couple fish in there that, you know, they'll, they'll lay their eggs and then they sit by their eggs. And if you get anywhere close to their eggs, they'll even come attack divers. Like, they'll, they'll get your finger. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to hurt you or anything like that. But they're like, hey, get out of here. Um, and in the case of those territorial fish, you want to make sure there's enough space for them. So our uh, bird habitat, real big habitat, got enough space for those fish to have their own little territory and not constantly just be fighting each other. So we do have fish that will set up a territory, be aggressive, like that ronkel, right, was sitting on top of its den, uh, that little territory. And, you know, if someone got in its den, it might get in there and try to, like, chase them out. Uh, but sometimes it's just like, well, that fish is too big for me. I'm not going to fight him. Another question? We got one more question for you. How long do rockfish live? Oh, that's a great question. I did mention it takes them a long time uh, to actually uh, be, be able to reproduce, right? They are long-lived, some of them. So things like quillbacks, we've found them over 15 years old. Um, but things like the yellow eye rockfish, right, which we've got one in here. It's, the, it's this. Let's see if I can point them. Beep, right there. Not a great. There's a little reflection there. Um, but the yellow eye rockfish, they can actually live up over 120 years. But they're not going to start reproducing until they're at least 20 years old or so. So if you're out there and you're fishing for rockfish, uh, or you're fishing for something else and you accidentally get a rockfish, if you get a little yellow eye, you know, if, it, if it's not 20 years old yet, it hasn't even been able to reproduce. And like I said, that can really lead to the degradation of these fish populations. So rockfish are one that they keep an eye on. But uh, the yellow eye rockfish, yeah, they're, they're pretty long-lived. Um, also canary rockfish are, are quite long-lived as well. All right, looks like maybe that's sort of the, the end of the questions. Actually, I've been mentioning these burrows, and I, I brought out some props. I brought out our kelps to show you, and seagrasses, and the burrows did end up coming up. So how do we make the burrows? Just to give you a little look behind the scenes, uh, we use a pipe, right? We'll just kind of cut a pipe in half, got this pipe. And the reason we'll do this is because, you know, we, we'll pile rocks up, and these dens in the wild are kind of made of these natural nooks and crevices that are in the rocks. But we don't want the rocks to you know, collapse on our fish. So we'll provide a safe little pipe for that fish, and then we'll pile rocks on top. Uh, and that way, you know, people will see sometimes like a head of a fish sticking out from their burrow. And sometimes there's large fish that wedge themselves down in burrows that seem too small for them. And people come to us, you know, if we're working out on the floor, they'll be like, I think your fish is stuck in the rocks. Uh, but that's one of the reasons we provide this, so that they don't get stuck in there. They can get themselves down into this safely reinforced den, uh, and then the rocks make it look like a more natural den. Uh, but we just don't want any accidents where someone might get squashed or trapped in their den. All right, so no more questions, it looks like. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming to another virtual visit here at the Alaska Sea Life Center. Of course, I want to thank our sponsors again. This is Royal Caribbean Group. Uh, they've been fantastic in making this season free so that we can get out there and every Wednesday at 11 a.m. we can bring you to the Sea Life Center uh, virtually. So again, I want to thank you for tuning in to these programs. Uh, it's really fun to be able to chat with folks, and we're glad to get any sort of questions. If you just, you know, if you bolt awake in the middle of the night and you go, oh gosh, I wish I had asked this when I had a chance, you can either leave a comment on this video once it's published, or you can email us at asktuffy at alaskasealife.org, and we'll get those questions, or we'll get the answers back to your questions for you. So again, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you again in another virtual visit.